Good evening. I would like to welcome you all here today on Indigenous Peoples Day to what promises to be a fun and notable book release event. I'm Alan Rumrell, Executive Director of the Historical Society of Cheshire County. The book is A Deep Presence, 13,000 Years of Native American History. The author is Professor Robert Goodby. And we would like to open the program by acknowledging that this event is being held in Endakina, the traditional homeland of the Abenaki people. And we were going to be pleased to welcome renowned Abenaki scholar Marge Bruchak in person tonight with her husband, Justin, to open this event. And she is an Abenaki, a scholar, a performer, and a historical consultant on, on this topic. And they agreed to open the program by performing an Abenaki welcome song. So. person, but know that our hearts are with you and we are ever so grateful for this book. Kutsi Oleoni, Dr. Goodby, Kutsi Oleoni, all of the Abenaki, and today is a beautiful day to be Indigenous. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry you couldn't be with us, but that was wonderful. Thank you very much. So on behalf of the Historical Society, I want to say how delighted we are that the Society was able to partner with Bob Goodby and the Harris Center for Conservation Education to ensure that this book was published and made available to the public. These two organizations actually were already working together on an Abenaki land acknowledgement statement when we were approached about the book. 
In a few minutes, Bob will illustrate how important this topic is to an understanding of our region. Despite that importance, our understanding of Native American history here has been incomplete and distorted for centuries, chiefly because most widely viewed histories of the region were compiled by white historians. Thanks to scholars like Marge, who we just heard, and Bob, our understanding is finally being clarified. This book will be an important step in that process. It illustrates a history that most of us know very little about. Through the use of archeology span and written history, Bob Goodby tells a scholarly, historical, and very entertaining story of, that offers all of us a more complete understanding of the millennia long history and presence of Native Americans in this region. Now I want to introduce Harris Center Executive Director, Jeremy Wilson, and to acknowledge and recognize the Harris Center for its role in this process. He will say a few words and introduce the author. Thanks, Alan. Hello, everyone. Uh, again, I'm Jeremy Wilson. I'm the Executive Director at the Harris Center for Conservation Education. And we, we uh, along with the uh, Historical Society, help uh, publish uh, the, the book we're going to hear more about tonight. So the Harris Center promotes understanding and respect for the natural world through uh, education in schools uh, throughout the region. We also have community programs throughout the year and throughout the region that we that we offer. We do land conservation, and we also uh, have a branch that does conservation research, really trying to understand what's happening with the land. We were so excited to help with the publication of this of Dr. Goodby's book because it it really helps to expose uh, some of the extraordinary rich history and culture of the native people. And it was just so exciting to be part of the project. What made us able to do it was that uh, we had some, we had a 50th fund uh, that, that last year was our 50th year and, and we raised money through the 50th fund to do innovative projects and this fit right into that. Um, so thanks to the generosity of 50th fund donors, we were able to, to contribute. So Robert Goodby is a professor of anthropology at Franklin Pierce University. He earned his uh, PhD in anthropology from Brown University. He has over 30 years of experience excavating Native American ar archeological sites in New England. And, and we have been pleased to welcome Bob as a speaker at the Harris Center for several occasions. He's always incredibly popular. We, we, we tend to fill rooms or even fill uh, Zoom, Zoom meetings with when we have Bob speaking. Uh, Bob is past president of the New Hampshire Archaeological Society, a former trustee of the Mount Kearsarge Indian Museum, and served on the New Hampshire Commission of Native American Affairs. He has directed over 300 archaeological studies authorized by the National Historic Preservation Act, and his work has appeared in anthropological journals and in art and anthologies published by the Smithsonian Institution Press and the University Press of New England. And with that, I want to welcome uh, Dr. Robert Goodby. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for uh, coming out tonight. I, I really appreciate it. I've been looking forward to this event for, uh, for some time. I do a lot of public speaking. I, I as, as many of you know, I, I do talks anytime someone asks me, and I'm very comfortable with it. This is my first book launch, okay? This is my first book. I'm not, thank you. <laughs> so, um, I'm not sure if I know what to do, but I'm gonna give it a shot anyway. Um, but yes, I, again, I'd like to, to welcome everyone and I'd like to welcome all the people. We have quite a few people on, on Zoom and you can't be in the room with us, but you are very much with us in, in spirit. So yeah, when I, when I started to write this book and like uh, most of the, the good things in my life, this book started off with my wife telling me to do something. And in this case, for, for quite a few years, she had been saying, you ought to write a book. I said, yeah, I should do that. And the last year with the uh, and sort of coming together of two things, I had a year of sabbatical from Franklin Pierce University and of course we had COVID. And so it was a good time to hunker down, be in my office and think about how um, I would like to write this. I already had an idea in mind for about 15 years now, I have been a speaker for a wonderful program we have here in New Hampshire called the Humanities to Go program uh, sponsored by New Hampshire Humanities. 
And through that, that program, I've traveled all over the state. I've given talks in wonderful old meeting houses like this one. I gave a talk in the New Hampshire State Prison in Berlin. I'm in a very, uh, very diverse audiences. And the thing that that program encourages uh, scholars to do is to take their work and bring it to a wider audience. Now, in the case of archeology, span what that means is I had to break out of my training because we are trained to be scientists and scholars and to write in very technical language. And in my field, like many academic fields, we get rewarded for writing things for our peers. Uh, doing things for the public is not considered to be a, a particularly prestigious activity. But I found with these humanities talks, I was having a blast. I was, I was able to take this information and to do what comes naturally. And so I have this quote up here from uh, one of my idols in archaeology, James Deitch, uh, who said, archaeologists are storytellers. When we do our work, we are telling a story. It's a story that has time. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It has unexpected events. It has interesting characters. And if you tell it the right way, it can reach a lot of people. And so with my humanities talks, that's what I, I found a way to do. And uh, the audience, audiences seem to like it. And so I decided to see if I could uh, turn that into a book. Yeah, I do, uh, I do uh, two talks for New Hampshire Humanities, uh, Digging into Native History in New Hampshire, which is a, a broad overview of studying Native American history through archeology, span and then one that focuses on a site right here in Keene, uh, the site that was uh, discovered before they built the new Keene Middle School called 12,000 Years Ago in the Granite State. And both of those talks appear in different ways in this book, along with a lot of other things that I've always wanted to bring into my talks and never had the, uh, the time or the room to do. So it was, uh, uh, it was a successful uh, experience in that, sort, in that sense. What I found happening was, was sort of interesting. As I was writing the story of Abenaki history, or at least my version of that story, I also realized I was writing a, a parallel story, which was my story of uh, becoming an archaeologist and the story of discovery and how these two things sort of uh, weave together. And uh, I decided that was, that was a good thing. So the book is written in the first person, and I, I do tell a lot of stories in uh, that fashion. I, I had another advantage here, which is uh, about 22 years ago at a really sort of critical juncture in, in what had passed for my career in archaeology. Uh, I was really in need of a full-time teaching job and wondering if I was going to be able to continue in this field. And I saw an ad looking for a full-time archaeologist at a place called Franklin Pierce University. Uh, I applied, got the job, and the rest is, is uh, uh, history or, or prehistory. And one of the things that was great about Franklin Pierce for me is it's a small school. And so when I went to teach archaeology, instead of teaching it in a big lecture hall with 250 people, I'd have a class of 25 students. And it would be a lab class, which meant there was a practical hands-on component to it. And I said, OK, if you want to learn archaeology, we're going to learn archaeology by doing it. And so I was able to take my students out in the field from their very first year and give them the sense to find out if this weird field was something that uh, they would be engaged in. And everything that is in this book is either a site that I've worked on as part of my teaching at Franklin Pierce or a site that has included Franklin Pierce students. So it's got a, a theme both in terms of the Monadnock region and also in terms of uh, uh, Franklin Pierce. So that has been a, a uh, critical thing. Okay? Now, in creating the book, okay, um, I once again, as, as I was starting to think about this, I scratched my head and I, I looked at my wife, who knows a lot more about this sort of thing than I do, and I said, what do I do? She said, boy, what you need is a scaffold. Okay? And she explained to me what a scaffold was, sort of the framework for creating the book, and um, I just happened to have this lovely picture from uh, right around the corner here, the, the Wall Dogs Project in Keene. And uh, so I created a scaffold. That was easy. I put together a framework. And the table of contents in the book is pretty much something I jotted down on a legal pad uh, about a year and a half ago. And then I started to write. And that part, uh, that part went well, too. And I had a, a great time doing it. It's one of the best experiences I've had. Not technical writing. 
I, I was having fun being the person I am at the humanities talks and, and writing in a, a narrative fashion, very different sort of um, experience. And then I finished the, the draft and I started putting pictures together and I said, okay, now I've got to get it published. Now keep in mind, this is my first book. Right? And I had this vague idea that, okay, when you write a book, what you do is you go find a publisher and the publisher says, sure, we'll publish it. And of course, you've got to try a number of different publishers. And as I got into this, I realized, oh my goodness, the publishing landscape has changed right? from what it was 10 or 15 years ago. Unless you are a commercially established, successful author these days, most presses require you to do what's called subvention, which means you have to come into a publishing project with financial backing. You have to have some supporters. I'm like, oh, God, what am I going to do now? I thought of all kinds of things. I thought, okay, I could do a GoFundMe campaign, except I'm not very good at computers. I could do a bake sale. Right? And uh, I was wondering how this was, was going to work. And after a few weeks of doing that, I said, wait a second. For the last 20 years in this region, I have worked with some outstanding nonprofit organizations. Maybe they'd be interested in backing me. And so I approached um, the, uh, the Harris Center and the Historical Society. And one of the most gratifying things about the whole process is once they had seen a draft, both of them agreed. And so I had some backing. I have also received support from the uh, Franklin Pierce University uh, faculty Development Fund, and all of that coming together uh, has made this project possible. So that was good. I had some backing. Now I needed a publisher. Uh, and I was casting around looking for someone who did the sort of book that I had in mind. And I knew about uh, Peter E. Randall Publishers from Portsmouth. I'd done a, a, a piece in an anthology they did quite a few years ago. And so I sent it out to them, and I'd sent it out to a few other publishers. And uh, Deirdre Randall uh, responded very quickly. Is Deirdre here tonight? Oh, there you are. Hello. Okay. Deirdre and Zach are here from, from Peter Randall. And um, I, I got back not only uh, an enthusiasm, uh, um, but from that point on, I had a partner who knew the publishing business and who was able to do things like talk me out of my first not so great idea for a title and, and help me with this whole process. And so, yeah, things were, uh, things were in gear. Uh, so I have a book, I have a publisher. Archeology span is something that is a highly visual discipline. We find things that you wanna see. We work on sites that have interesting things. It doesn't work if you just have uh, text. Part of what I was doing uh, was looking for pictures. I wanted this to be a really nicely uh, illustrated book. And like with uh, much of the rest of it, I had a lot of help here. Um, I had one of my friends, Garrett Evans, who's here tonight, a friend, colleague, former student, who is also a masterful photographer uh, who helped me with a, a lot of this production. I had another friend, um, uh, my, my late friend, uh, Steve Bailey, who's a very fine photographer and did many of the images in here. Uh, Steve was also a native of this city. Uh, born and raised in Keene, and had, I think, a wonderful time working on the uh, ancient site at the, at the Keene Middle School. Told me one day when I, I arrived for work, and he'd already been on site for about an hour, and I, I said, what are you doing? He said, I, I love this place. He said, I used to play in these woods when I was a kid, and I'm, I'm very happy that a lot of his, his photos can appear here. And then I had a, another connection. Uh, one of the teachers at the Keene Middle School who um, really embraced this material and uh, came up with the idea of doing some illustrations based first on the, uh, the site at the middle school. And we're now working on a project to design posters for um, uh, schools all over the region. Uh, but Miranda Nelkin, who's a wonderful artist and illustrator, uh, created the beautiful illustration that is on the cover of this book uh, with her colleague, Rex Barker. Are you here, Miranda? Hi, Miranda. Hey, thank you very much. Um, so uh, this is one of the things that I, I really like about it because this, this topic does uh, require uh, those sorts of things. So um, the storytelling. Okay. Don't laugh. Do you recognize that guy? Okay. Oh, what happened? Okay. 
<laughs> that is that is that is yours truly. Uh, the second summer that I was doing archaeology, working at the uh, uh, the Eddy site in Manchester, New Hampshire, and I, I throw that in there because part of this book is is my story as an archaeologist. I look happy there, and 36, 37 years later, I'm still happy uh, doing this. But the introduction uh, sort of lays things out, um, and it talks about the idea of storytelling and the different stories that run through this, and talks about another theme that I've thought about a lot as an archaeologist. Archaeologists are trained to be scientists. Okay, we're trained to be scientific. We're trained to work with data and, and come up with hypotheses that we can test in a very formal fashion. And almost everything we find is material. It's stuff. It's, it's rocks. It's ceramics. It's things we can weigh and measure. And that's what we do our scientific work on. The problem that we have very often, particularly in this part of the world, is that we become too engrossed in our objects and we forget that what we're really after here is people because there are so many things about people that you can't see from the little bits of stone or the broken pieces of pottery. You can't understand that their lives were like our lives, that they had uh, an emotional component, a spiritual component, that one of the most important things in their world was family, was kinship. Those things are very hard to see when you're just looking at the little fragments that have uh, survived over the thousands of years. And so what I have done in, in this is to is to use the science as much as I can and then use that as an inspiration and to create places where I can write a little creatively about what the, uh, the human lives of these people have been like. I also look at some of the practical problems. So the uh, picture on the right there is, uh, that's me working happily on a site right near Amaskeg Falls, but that's an aerial photograph of all the devastation in that area. Uh, we had some of the deepest and richest archaeological sites in the state, and they are now, for the most part, gone. And that's that's part of the uh, uh, part of the struggle that we have as archaeologists. Okay. My second chapter, okay, I entitled uh, "Who Are the Native People?" Not "Who Were," which is the way I usually get the question. And this is a chapter I wrote, and I, I'm thinking I have quite a few uh, Native people in the audience tonight who are probably thinking, we don't need you for that. And you don't, okay? but non-native people are very interested in this and they, they really want to understand that. And so here I talk about who the uh, native inhabitants of this area were, what we mean when, when anthropologists say the word Abenaki and uh, what is the, the nature of that? And one of the things I began thinking about as I was uh, doing this, and one of the, the themes that kind of ended up running through the book is that native societies, at least as I understand them, don't have real hard and fast, sharp, dark lines that separate them from other people. The native societies I'm looking at are, are characterized by connections, by ties of culture and kinship that, that extend over uh, huge uh, distances. And so rather than talk about, you know, giving people a name and drawing a boundary and saying, okay, that's all you need to know, I, I try to tease out uh, some of those complexities. The next chapter, opening the puzzle. A lot of archaeologists use the analogy of archaeology as a jigsaw puzzle because it works, right? You look for the pieces, put them together, and get the big picture. But here I talk about some of the problems with our puzzle in New England the kinds of things that we find, and especially the kinds of things that we don't find because so much is missing. We don't have very good preservation in this area. And so doing the archeology span requires uh, looking for a lot of things you can't see. So I talk about the nature of our sites. I talk about uh, the importance of waterways and, and travel by canoe. I talk about the, the artifacts, uh, the pottery, the stone tools, uh, the bone, and where all these things come from and, and try to get you uh, uh, a sense of what this evidence is that I'm going to go on to uh, talk about in the next chapters. Okay. So I look at four sites in this book in detail. All of them are in this region. Uh, all of them I either uh, excavated in my capacity as a professor at Franklin Pierce or um, uh, with Franklin Pierce students. So the very earliest uh, one I did, uh, just a, a year or so after I started at Franklin Pierce, was the Swansea Fish Dam. 
which is only about four miles south of where we are right now in a remarkable part of Swansea called Sawyer's Crossing, where there's just a, a very rich record of 12,000 years of Native American occupation. But our challenge at this site was taking this dam that had been known about for a long time and actually trying to prove that it was built by Native people and, and try to figure out uh, when it was built by Native people. And it was a tense situation for me. It's my first field school with my Franklin Pierce students. And I had a whole bunch of them and they were very enthusiastic. And I wasn't sure we were gonna find anything, okay? <laughs> which I didn't tell them, okay? Um, fortunately, okay, it, it turned out to be a, a wonderful site and I think added not only a chapter to the history of this region, but proved to archeologists all across New England that native people did build substantial things out of stone, which had been the, um, the subject of uh, some debate, okay? Um, my second site is in the town of Peterborough. And I was thinking about this a lot this summer, even though we excavated the site back in uh, 2007. And I was thinking about it because during COVID, my, my wife and I have gotten into a habit if the weather is nice. We drive into Peterborough, we get some takeout food, and there's a little park down by the river. And I mean a little park, okay? Um, but you can walk down a, a path and there's one picnic table sitting by the river. And we sit there and we eat. And every time I sit there, I say the same thing because I'm looking at the place where the Nubanusit uh, uh, Brook comes into the Kantukuk River, the kind of confluence that native people love to settle at. And I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, wow, there must have been quite a site here at one time. And then I'm looking and I'm saying, yeah, and then they built a railroad through it in the 1850s. And this has all been torn up by a sewer and this is a little shopping plaza, and there's pretty much nothing left of it. Uh, one, of the, one of the most important areas in the Monadnock region, and it was all gone before there was any archeologist around here to, uh, to look for it. Um, but okay, uh, back in, in 2007, we worked on a site up the Nubanusit, okay, sort of near the, the Peterborough-Hancock border, and we found this really neat little site on a knoll overlooking wetlands uh, at the headwaters of the Nubanusit River. And it was a place where people came not for a long time, maybe for an afternoon here and there, but they did so repeatedly over 5,000 years and left us little concentrations of artifacts we could see and burned animal bone that included beaver and the bones of three different species of turtles. Uh, giving us a sense of at least this part of the, the system of land use that people had in the, uh, in the Peterborough area. The next site uh, is uh, down in Hinsdale. And this one illustrates a couple of things. One is the battle that archeologists are facing every day to try and save sites that are being destroyed either by natural processes, in this case, erosion, or by uh, development. And this is a site that we worked on in, in 2004, 2005, right on the banks of the Connecticut River. And as you can see in that photo in the upper left, as we were working on it, the little bit of this site that was remaining was busy sliding down into the river. And so the, the real emphasis here was simply on trying to save uh, what was going to be lost. We didn't know what we were gonna find. What we found was another one of these sites that was really rich, that had evidence for multiple layers and periods of occupation, showing that native people had come here again and again. But all it was was the little edge, the little remnant of what had been a much larger site extending way out into the Connecticut River, all of which was gone. And we're working on, on just this fringe here. But even in, in that, we found remarkable stuff. We found all sorts of stone tools, pottery, uh, and it was layered going down uh, deeply. We also found very unusual pieces of burned bone. And when they were given to an expert, they were determined to be snake. And most of them were from timber rattlesnake. And not just one snake, because they were all the way through the different levels of the site going back almost 5,000 years. And the native people were coming here and one of the many things they were doing was going up to the top of Wintasket Mountain, which is, has been a haven for rattlesnakes for a long time, which is really interesting, but then also leads to the question of, what does that mean? What are, what are people doing? Uh, was this a sacred activity? 
and there's evidence to support that. Right? Was this just a food source? That could have been the same thing too. One of these, one of these questions that uh, archaeologists are very good at asking, and uh, often all we can do at the end of the day is, is just sort of think about these things. And then, of course, uh, I talk about the site at the Keene Middle School. Uh, this was the, uh, the site of a lifetime for me, in all likelihood. Maybe not, but, you know, could well be. Um, one of the oldest sites in all of New England. In fact, you can't really point to another site in New England and say this one is older than this site. Its official name is the, uh, the Tenant Swamp site. Not only is it old, but as, as many of you know, we had the miraculously preserved intact outlines of where four tents had been set up. 12,600 years ago by some of the very first people to come into this part of the world, who at the time were camping on the edge of the Ashwillet River, which has since meandered and migrated uh, closer to downtown Keene. This was a remarkable chance to get a detailed life at a detailed look at the life of uh, the so-called Paleo Indians. With the maps we made of the artifacts, we could, in essence, walk into their houses and see what they had done where and compare their houses to their neighbors' houses. And it was just a, a remarkable leap back in time and a very, very exciting site. And again, it's right here in Keene, an area that uh, has a, a very, very rich uh, history of Native American occupation. Okay. Now, a lot of people, if, if they were to start and ask a question about the, uh, the Native history, of this area, uh, they might come into the historical society here and pick up a history of Keene and, and see what it says. And one of my favorite foils okay, is uh, Simon Griffin who wrote the, the History of Keene published in 1904. It's a very detailed book, uh, he put a lot into it, but he was a, a product of his time and he addresses the question of the Indians in the very first part of the book and basically says, yeah, they wandered through once in a while, but they really didn't live here. So on to more interesting things, said Mr. Griffin. Okay. Now, the reality is, of course, much different. The archaeology, and I think one of the most important things about this evidence that's in this book, is that it's no longer possible to buy that line and to say that Native people were no longer here. Because we have evidence from within a five-mile radius of where we are sitting here that that presence was continuous. And it didn't end with the arrival of the Europeans, it continued. And that's part of the interesting story too. One of the stories I encountered in doing this, and it was one that Marge Bruchak had introduced me to uh, many years ago, is the remarkable uh, story of the Sedekis family here in Keene. Uh, Israel and Mary Sedekis were Abenaki Indians who'd been living at the uh, Abenaki uh, uh, community up in Odenac in Quebec. They decided to uh, move down south, got in a canoe, took it down the Connecticut River, and ended up uh, settling in Keene. And for decades, were prominent members of this community. Uh, they, they, uh, a couple of the Sedeke sisters may have been some of the first Native American registered nurses. Um, one of the sisters had a millinery shop right off the square in Keene. Uh, the son served in the armed forces. They were uh, very highly regarded members of the community. And this lovely picture on the left here is a, a picture of Elizabeth Sedeke, the last of the uh, 12 Sedeke children. It's her uh, high school graduation picture. And it's still a tough story, even with this. Um, one of the things I saw a few years ago in an exhibit uh, curated by Lynn Murphy, uh, one of Elizabeth's granddaughters, who is, is are, Lynn, are you here with us tonight? Lynn was gonna be here with us tonight, okay. Um, but one of the things that I, I saw in this exhibit she did was Elizabeth's birth certificate in which both of her parents under race are listed as Indians, but Elizabeth is listed as white. And the family understanding is that because the family was so well liked and so well regarded, the folks at the hospital assumed they were doing them a favor by taking away Elizabeth's identity. Um, it can still be a tough history, but here we are. And I have worked with uh, uh, two of Elizabeth's granddaughters to, to get this picture 
and other information uh, about the family here in Keene. Um, Griffin was wrong. Okay? Native people have been here. Native people are still here. Uh, and I end the book um, with this, this picture on the right, which I'm very, very fond of, fond of, of my friend Sherry Gould, who is a, a master Abenaki basket maker. And uh, Sherry is with us tonight, and, and here she is um, passing this on. So I was, uh, I was gonna uh, close this tonight um, by uh, asking uh, the Native folks, whether you are on, on Zoom or uh, whether you are in the room, um, if you could just very quickly, uh, just sort of, if you don't mind, just make yourself known maybe by, by standing up, I would appreciate that, okay? Okay, thank you. Um, so I wanted to, I wanted to, yeah. thank you. I, I wanted to, to end by, by saying to the folks who just stood that uh, uh, your presence and, and what you do more than any book or any archeological dig makes it plain that this is a real story and that it's an ongoing story. And I am uh, very much looking forward to uh, uh, seeing you write the next chapter of this. I'm honored by your presence this evening and I wanna thank you and I would like to thank everybody here uh, for coming out tonight. Okay, thank you. And the, the folks who are running this event said I, I am able to take uh, a few questions. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to. That was easy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, is about the, the nature of our evidence and the, the problem with seeing a lot of it. And then uh, more specifically, um, did the, the colonists uh, seek to hide it? Uh, so that's an interesting question. Um, the evidence is hard to see. And so it's very easy to grow up in this area and, and not see that evidence. Uh, the native people who were here uh, kept their populations low. Uh, they would move from season to season. So their, their houses, their architecture was not massive and enduring. Um, so you don't, you don't see uh, the archeology span unless you, you look for it. And the very first sentence of the book is, uh, it's, it's there if you know where to look. Um, you know, initially uh, the colonists, sure, they, they tried to erase native history. More importantly, at the very beginning, uh, they tried to erase native people. And the, the history of almost every town in the Monadnock region begins with that conflict in the 18th century. And almost every town, including Keene, has a story of when the town was abandoned because the native inhabitants okay, uh, were sufficiently unhappy to persuade the, uh, the invaders to, to leave and, and go somewhere else. It's, it's a difficult history. Right? It's a bloody history. It includes things like scalp bounties that were paid by the colonial governments. And they were a lot of money. They, they really wanted to provide an incentive to get rid of the Abenaki. And so you could, uh, you could at different times get 50 pounds for the scalp of an Abenaki man. That was a lot of money in the 18th century. You would get lesser amounts for the scalps of women and children, but still be paid for them. And that sort of process is, is, it's part of the history. And it's one of the things that I think on uh, Indigenous Peoples Day, uh, we need to look at. So the, the sort of physical erasure was the, the big one. As far as the, uh, the material signs, once you get into the, the 19th century, uh, the native people are no longer seen as a threat. Most people don't even uh, uh, think they're here. When things are discovered, they're remarked on. So we actually have, you know, some good written accounts of the first settlers seeing the Swansea Fish Dam and seeing the carvings up at Bellows Falls and talking about how they were made by the Indians. Um, and oddly enough, the real destruction of a lot of those sites doesn't happen until the late 19th or early 20th century. So, but yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question basically is, is why is the Swansea fish dam where it is of all the places it, yeah, it might be? Yeah, a couple of things about that. One is um, 
we should probably not assume that that is the only dam on the Ashwalet River. Okay, in other parts of Eastern North America where native people were using these dams, there are multiple dams. There are some rivers in the mid-Atlantic region that have you know, 11 or 14 or 15 dams over a 10 or 12 mile stretch. Um, so we might have some more out there. But yeah, why that spot? And I actually, I actually puzzled on that. And I was, I was sort of embarrassed because I was puzzling publicly about why it was located there. I mean, it is naturally a shallow, rocky stretch of the river. Um, but uh, uh, Tom Wessels, a professor from Antioch, was in the audience and he kind of looked at me. I'm sure thinking to himself, what are you, slow? Okay. And, and said, maybe that's just where there were a lot of rocks. Yeah. I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, in, in my defense, that was before we were able to uh, uh, create a really accurate map of the dam uh, before the water level had dropped so we could actually see it. And sure enough, the way the dam was built was there are some large natural boulders in the river at that point, and they just connected them with walls of, of smaller stone. So I think that was the advantage right there. So, so would you have something to do also with uh, the seasons when the hills were yeah, I'm, I'm sure there was a, a lot of uh, knowledge that went into it. Um, one of the things, and, and you don't often see these terms used when talking about what Native people are doing, but Native people knew botany, they knew zoology, they knew geology, and they knew it in detail, and they knew their river. Uh, and so they needed a stretch that was shallow, that was rocky, where you could have easy access from at least one bank so you weren't scrambling up and down a a uh, steep slope. And I think that location met all of those criteria. And so for the better part of 4,000 years, uh, uh, that dam is being used. And it's, it's substantial enough, so yes, you can still see it today. Yes, sir. Can you tell us a little bit about your impressions when you first uh, did your initial assessment of the community middle school site? Hey. What impressed you about it? What, what jumped out at you? Uh -huh. Yeah, my, what were my impressions when I first went to the Keene Middle School site? Um, when I first went out there to sort of assess, did this have any potential to have an archaeological site? I had the same reaction that, that pretty much all of my colleagues had. Uh, I walked through the woods. I saw this dead level sandy terrace. There's not a lot of those around here. Uh, dead flat terrace overlooking a huge area of wetlands that has all kinds of things uh, indigenous people can can eat and use and things of that sort. And it also had not been disturbed, hadn't been built on, there were no roads, no foundations. And so those things made me think, yeah, I think there's a good chance there's going to be a native site here. I did not think there's a good chance there's going to be a really, really old native site here. That, that surprise came later. It probably shouldn't have been a surprise because we have one other site from that time period in Cheshire County it's a, a few miles to the south uh, on a high level sandy terrace overlooking the Ashwalet River. So I think those sorts of settings were ones that were uh, chosen by the first people here. But yeah, when I first walked out there, I said, yeah, this looks promising, but I had no idea. Okay. And, and that realization unfolded over time, much to the dismay of the people who are trying to get the school built. So yes. <laughs> Yeah, so the, what percentage of the book do I spend talking about the artifacts versus talking about how the, the Native people lived? And I, I probably wouldn't want to draw a line between the two of those because they're, they're part and parcel of the same thing. The artifacts are only, I'm only interested in them as a means to an end to, to figure out how Native people lived. So they're, they're almost never discussed just as objects. And I'm always, always trying to make that connection. And, and that's why in, in the United States and North America, archeology span is, is not its own discipline, it's part of anthropology, it's part of the, the science of human beings. Um, and it's, it's a means to an end to try to see exactly what people were doing. So yeah, that's something I, I tried very hard to do. Okay. Yes. Um, I know where the Keene Middle School is, I can't recognize it at the time. It's a tenant site. Swamp right there. Yeah. The the middle school is is built on it. If you want to go to where the tenant site uh, tenant swamp site was, okay, it's you walk to the back of the school and you'll see this wonderful oval track. Okay, most of it was on sort of the far edge of that track, 
And what happened was uh, we, we spent the better part of the summer excavating the site. As soon as we felt we were done and had gotten everything that was there, they came in with skidders and bulldozers and took that entire terrace down 10 or 12 feet. So you can go there and you can be right on the spot where those people were living 12,600 years ago. You're just way below uh, the level they were on. Um, but when I, when I make a, at least my pre-COVID fall pilgrimages to the middle school to uh, talk to the sixth graders there, um, one of the things we always do is at the end of my talk, we go out to that field and we stand on that spot. And I have some of my students help me with a little demonstration of using a spear thrower and things of that sort, but also say, this is it. It was right here. Um, so yeah, that spot is, is there. And the, the teachers at the middle school, uh, again, with some of uh, Miranda's wonderful illustrations, have got a beautiful educational sign at the beginning of a boardwalk that goes out to Tenant Swamp talking about the, uh, the Paleo-Indian site. And uh, so, yeah, that's, that's there. Yep. One, of the, uh, one of the measures that was required uh, as part of that project was that we take the information we found and bring it back to the community bring it back to the taxpayers who were paying for that study. And so that was one part of that effort. So yeah, you can, you can go there. And if the question is that we have this pile of stones, this little sort of linear arrangement of small stones at the tenant swamp site. And the importance of that, we didn't realize at the time we were excavating it, but once we put everything together and looked at the maps of where the artifacts were, we realized that those stones marked the edge of the tent that these people were living in. And so it was sort of a, a guide to tell us how big that tent was, which we could then apply to the other three oval shaped clusters of artifacts. So we actually have very good measurements on the size of these people's houses, how many people could fit in them and, and things of that sort. And that's, that often happens in archeology, span very mundane things that by themselves don't tell you a whole lot. If you look at them in context in their relationship to the other things on the site, they can tell you quite a bit which is why archeologists are always obsessive about mapping, about recording the locations of, of the things that we're finding. Yes, sir. Yeah, good question. Um, for professionals like yourself and others, there is the data and the science, and then there's the spirituality of the event. So can you explain to the audience, because one of the big things I have as chief of our tribe is that you want to make sure that you get information for education, but not have a treasure map where people can go and dig up yeah. all the stuff. So can you explain a little bit in people's writings or how you deal with that balance between respecting um, that so it's not just a, a roadmap to treasure hunters, but it's also about education. You know, where, where's that? Yeah. What do you guys do to protect that? Um, yeah, how, how do you balance the, the need to talk about what you're finding and what you're learning with the need to protect these sites? Okay. Um, that's a good question. These sites are in danger from all kinds of things, and one of them is looting. Okay. Uh, there are still people who will loot archaeological sites, who will find artifacts, put them on eBay, or just you know hoard them for their own uh, uh, personal enjoyment. And that is a tough balancing act for the archaeologists. For those of you who have, have gotten all the way through the book, you will notice that at no point do I give you a map showing you where anything really is, okay? Um, and it's for exactly that reason. So we, we keep these locations uh, vague until, you know, we know we're working with someone whose intentions are good. Um, so it is a balancing act, very definitely. Okay, well, thank you folks for, for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it.